He learned how many other vessels had ships had been attacked by Greek pirates and wrote, I have every reason to believe that for the last three months, we are the only persons sailing without convoy who have escaped. So he was taking real risks. The road conditions were atrocious. There were bandits. There's extreme poverty everywhere. Earthquakes. There was one in 1837 in Palestine, as it was known at the time, which was 6.5, possibly even 7 on the Richter scale. If my business were in candles, the sun would not set. However I struggle, I cannot succeed. If I dealt in shrouds, no one would die as long as I lived. Welcome to History for the Curious. I'm Mena Reisner, and I host the internationally renowned lecturer, dynamic historian, and tour guide, Rabbi Aubrey Hirsch. Experience our history, confront dilemmas, and reveal the untold stories of 3,000 years of Jewish heritage, from Paris to Cairo, from the Russian Tsar to Maimonides, and from the Sino Revelation to the French Revolution. Join the fastest growing Jewish history podcast in the world by subscribing to this channel and discovering the events that have shaped us into who we are today. And welcome back, Rabbi Hirsch. This week we'll be releasing two podcasts. We're going to be finishing the final installment of the letters tonight, and that will be covering events starting in the 11th century. And we're also going to be releasing a shorter podcast about the current goings-on in the ICJ that everyone has heard about, and you'll be telling us some possibly lesser-known facts about the uh, the whole proceedings there. Well, um, explaining where Israel stands legally in the proceedings and why it isn't as straightforward one way or the other as people might. A lawyer as well as a historian. Not really, but I've got uh, friends in high places. Yeah. Okay. So, letters. Yes. So, I'd like to cover two, but at greater length this evening. The first is about one of the most famous Jews of the past 200 years, Sir Moses Montefiore, but an aspect less thought about, uh, less known, and based on his letters and the diary entries of his wife. We know, obviously, that Montefiore was the uh, Stadlan par excellence of the Jewish people, you know, the, the defender of the Jews everywhere in the world, traveling to speak to the Tsar, to heads of countries who had no love for the Jews, dealing with blood libels, and obviously his strong connection with Eretz Israel. And in fact, he travels there seven times. Also, everyone knows in Eretz Israel the major windmill in Yerushalayim, yep. um, the first Yishuv outside the walls, and that he was such a big donor and he helped build up the country. Yes. And yes. It was a major asset. Yep. So. It was an enormous transformation that he brought about. But what I would like to focus on, and perhaps especially in the light of the situation there currently, is his Mesiris Nefesh meaning the almost extreme circumstances of his visits, in particular the second one in 1839, it wasn't just a a case, uh, I don't know, of having a a couple of meetings in an air-conditioned five-star hotel, having just stepped off a plane where, you know, the people flew first class. It's months of travel on donkeys and horses. Uh, There was the heat, there was rampant disease uh, for which there was little protection, irrespective of a person's financial means. The road conditions were atrocious. There were bandits. There's extreme poverty everywhere. Earthquakes. There was one in 1837 in Palestine, as it was known at the time, which was 6.5, possibly even 7 on the Richter scale, and in which more than half the inhabitants of Tzvas died. And he's often forced to sleep in tents in the open, and all of this doesn't deter him. Something we don't think about much. No, no. But I'd like to briefly introduce it by looking at his very first visit, which took place 12 years earlier in 1827. And that itself was not an easy decision, as Montefiore himself writes. In Malta, he was advised by the governor there to travel in a warship 
if you wanted to make sure that he made it safely to you know the shores to to Haifa, and he interestingly he also describes spending Tishabov. He, they were still in Malta, and he awaits three stars uh, to break the fast. You know, there weren't uh, any uh, convenient Jewish calendars printed in Malta in the early part of the 1800s. He gets to Alexandria in Egypt, and uh, when he left, he writes, I more ardently desire to leave Egypt than ever our forefathers did. No one shall ever recite the Passover service with more devotion than I when God returns me to my own country. But the interesting thing is that the result of that first trip was far more than meeting uh, the people there. It was a religious awakening. He writes, and I quote, This day I begin a new era. I fully intend to dedicate much more time to the welfare of the poor and to attend synagogue regularly on Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. And in fact, from then on, he took a sheikhate with him on his many trips all over. And in fact, at the outcome or the, the, the uh, result of that trip, he learned how many other vessels had ships had been attacked by Greek pirates and wrote, I have every reason to believe that for the last three months, we are the only persons sailing without convoy who have escaped. So he was taking real risks. Now, possibly his most interesting trip is the one in 1839. And, you know, overnights ranged from a tent to a palace. Uh, The plague was rampant that year. And they landed in Beirut on May the 11th, 1839. And from there, they go south through Lebanon until they get to Tzvas, where the 4,000 Jews made up at least half of the town's total population. And Moses Montefiore sits with uh, Rabbi Ram Dov of Avri. Is that the Basayan? That is the author of the famous Sefer Basayin, which I have to admit is a favourite of mine. So you make an annual siyum, no doubt. Well, I have in Kislev, if memory serves. Uh, but no, I actually try and learn the Basayin every Shabbos. And he was the head of the Ashkenazi Shul and the Ashkenazi Kihila in Tzvas, which had gone through calamitous times. And he and those around him, literally, had survived with miracles, with Nisim. Uh, There was a pogrom in 1834 that lasted over 30 days. And then the devastating earthquake that I mentioned of 1837. So during the meeting that they had together, uh, Rav Romdov hands Montefiore a petition, uh, which was signed by the residents, asking him to buy land for the Jews. And he succeeded in helping the Jews to establish farming settlements. And then he records in the, or in fact, his wife records in the diary on Friday, May 24th, with regards to the previous day. So Moses was again engaged from nine till six with the distribution of the money. He also gave special donations to the heads of schools and yeshivas and endeavoured to alleviate the distress among the poor of all non-Israelite communities, and so not just to the Jews. So Moses found his brethren most anxious to be employed and to earn their own bread, to cultivate the land as the most likely means to raise them from their present destitute condition. But their means were so limited that they could ill afford to keep a pair of oxen to till the ground. There was no lack of spirit. And so Moses thought that some trifling assistance from the proper persons in Europe would speedily restore health and plenty, should such be the will of heaven. The scene we witnessed yesterday amply repaid us for the fatigues of the entire journey. We saw nearly every individual inhabitant of Tzvas. So Moses gave each at least one Spanish dollar, and some fathers of families received eight or ten dollars. I hope, said Sir Moses, that the money I have had the pleasure of distributing yesterday will produce some comfort and give assistance to the Jews of Tzvas, especially in their present forlorn situation. Their sufferings during the last five years must have been truly deplorable, 
At the present moment, the ruins of the town present an awful spectacle of destruction. The few miserable hovels they have erected offer the most part little better than caves, more fit for the beast of the field than for human beings. Many are merely four mud walls with a mat for a roof. I think the poverty of the Jews in Tzvas to be great beyond anything that can be imagined, either in England or on the continent of Europe. I am informed and do believe that many are actually starving and that great numbers died last year of hunger. Nearly all the people are stamped with want and wretchedness. They are of refined manner and exhibit much intelligence in their conversation. Oh, he's painting quite a dire picture of the time. It was. Life was very difficult. We also, it's a, a, an aspect of uh, early years in Eretz Yisrael, uh, was to undertake the journey and the decision to live there was an absolute decision. <laughs> it wasn't taken lightly by any it's means. It's fascinating to hear this about Tzfas, who anyone who's visited would know it's a very pretty, picturesque town. Of right. Are the houses there not at least, because it's only 150 years ago, so are they not at least 150 years old and they look quite decent. Some of the city, we know for instance, some of the shuls are older than that and survived. Yeah. Uh, but there was a lot of destruction there. And it's interesting, by the way, Tzvas is one of the few cities where there is no church. Uh, there is a mosque in the very bottom layer of the concentric circle, so to speak, of Tzvas. No church there at all. So did he carry out a census at the time to get information about the he poverty actually, levels? And he actually carried out a census on almost each occasion. There were six altogether. And we, therefore, as you say, have much information available about the people there, about their financial means, uh, about the type of jobs they undertook, what institutions existed. So yes, he uh, he was not just somebody who distributed funds. He made sure to understand what the needs were and how to respond to them specifically. There's another diary entry at Thursday, May 30th. Their labor, that of distributing to the poor, was not finished before 10 in the evening. The fatigue of the distribution being exceptionally great, of the sheep brought to Lady Montefiore by the governor's wives, Sir Moses distributed it to the descendants of Aaron, those parts which belong to them. In other words, you get sheep, you shecht it, that's your dinner, and he gave the appropriate parts to the Kohanim. Then it took several days for Sir Montefiore and Lady Judith to reach Jerusalem, but because the plague was still ongoing inside Yerushalayim, the couple sort of set up shop on Harazes in the Mount of Olives, and they frequently spent the night out, basically in the open, in, in tents. It's, it's unthinkable, someone on that level of wealth from London, who I'm assuming was used to quite a luxurious life here, yeah. to go to that level of... Uh you know, discomfort. Very basic, to put it mildly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no plumbing there. Yes, absolutely. And then finally, on the 12th of June, they enter into Yerushalayim, they visit shawls and then, you know, various communal leaders. They go on to Hebron. And on June the 20th, they begin the journey back to Beirut. Did um, Lady Montefiore always join him on his travels? Mostly. Not all, but mostly, yes. Um, and now for uh, another quote, because we go to um, another sort of unknown but incredible element of his travel. I mean, I say unknown. If anybody has read through his diaries, they will come across it. But the extracts that people are often aware of don't include these pieces, and they, in a way they should. Um, at 8 p.m., we reached the quarantine cordon at the foot of Hara Carmel, about two miles from Haifa. Having always kept ourselves in quarantine since we left Beirut and lodged in our own tents, avoiding all villagers, we expected to have been allowed to pass without detention. But the officer in command informed Sir Moses that he and his party must perform quarantine and suggested that we have all our things dipped into the sea twice, once on that day and once after seven days. Second COVID test. Right. Or, after or, travel. Or, or para duma. Um, <laughs> Mr. Young, the British consul in Yerushalayim, told Sir Moses that Mr. Kilby of Beirut sent out a report in which he said that war was inevitable, that all the country was in a disturbed state and the roads infested with robbers. Several assassinations had taken place at Beirut. 
Last week, two Jews left Beirut with $300 for the community of Hebron, which had been sent from Amsterdam for the congregation. They were stopped near Kasmia, robbed of the money and dreadfully beaten, as a result of which one died. When he hears this, Moses Montefiore responded, How wonderful are the ways of heaven! The second night after we left Beirut, we thought ourselves most unfortunate in being compelled to sleep in the open air, as we were too fatigued to reach our tents and luggage, which were already at Kasmir. Had we continued our journey and succeeded in reaching that place, we should in all probability have shared the same fate as the other two Jews. Wow. Well, he could have been killed. Then the uh, diary entry for Shabbos, June 29th. The day was spent in repose with prayers and reading the Tanakh. Being so close to Hara Carmel, our thoughts naturally turned to the prophet Eliyahu Anovi, because that is where he has his duel with the Nevi'e Habal, with the false prophets. And so, in addition to the usual Shabbos prayers, Sir Moses read to us the 18th chapter of Melochim Aleph in a most solemn manner and with such fervor that everyone present was deeply affected. They were undecided how to get to Alexandria. They didn't want to go by sea because the boats from Haifa to Alexandria were very small, but the route to the by road to Beirut, uh, the shore road was infected. It, 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 it had thieves uh, at every point, and the road through Nablus was basically impassable. And so Moses relied on God's protection, and he decides to go. So, you know, he is an Eretz Yisrael for nearly two months under life-threatening conditions, yet he would come back to Eretz Yisrael on five further occasions. The last one, by the way, when he was 91. Wow. Was this to show sort of moral support, or was this purely to give money? Because I'm assuming he could have sent... Yes, it was both, and also because Eretz Yisrael was something he felt so attached to. As you may know, and as many listeners uh, may know, the shape of the building and the sort of the tomb over his wife's grave in Ramsgate is the shape of Keva Rachel, done because of that. And eventually when he reaches uh, Beirut, Sir Moses had a visit from the governor of the town who gave him the official account that 12,000 prisoners had been captured and the killed and wounded on both sides were 9,000. So, you know, he's much more than simply a beloved figure. This is somebody who's a leader and was determined to help Jews in Israel very personally. Wow. What was the, the rough timeline of his? You said he became religious post a trip to... Um, 1827, yeah. And that was a result of his trip with what he saw yes. there? And he'd always been orthodox. But as we've spoken about in previous podcasts in England, where they didn't have the revolutionary reform nor the strong orthodoxy set up, it meant that certain things were a uh, given, certain things you would absolutely do. And some things they weren't aware of. Or it wasn't just what everybody carried out, and therefore it sort of fell by the wayside because it wasn't the norm. And this is something that he became very determined about. Now, we'll finish with one additional letter which was written to him on June 14th, 1841. The British Colonel Charles Henry Churchill wrote a letter to Sir Moses Montefiore supporting the creation of a Jewish state in Palestine. Churchill was the British consul to Ottoman Syria, which included Palestine. He was also an evangelical Protestant and the ancestor of the future Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And he is possibly one of the first to suggest the political establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine. He advised that the Jews should commence agitation to resume their political existence as a people. And he believed that with the aid of the European powers, that Jews would attain in the end the sovereignty of at least Palestine. And he finished his letter writing, and this is quite impressive. God has put in my heart the desire to serve his ancient people. I have discharged a duty imposed on me by my conscience. 
So interesting. Yes. It wasn't politically motivated at all. No, not at all. And in fact, Montefiore took Churchill, he wrote two letters to the Board of Deputies, of which he was the president for many years. But on November 8th, uh, 1842, they responded to Montefiore that they would not be initiating Churchill's proposal or any other for settlement in Palestine, but would participate if a Jewish community in another country would, because at the time, it was so far from people's thought process that it was it was a pipe dream. Wow. Shame, almost a shame it never got uh, no. chased. No. Wow. Okay. So on to our second letter, I guess. Yes, which is uh, also in some ways a mini biography and a letter and a poem. And here we are talking about Rav Avram Ibn Ezra, who was born in probably Tudela, but within the Spanish region in or around 1089. He was a Parshan, right, a Bible commentator, and also a Paitan, somebody who wrote uh, Piyutim. Uh, his early life was definitely spent in Spain, mainly in Cordoba, where he devoted his time to Torah. He also became proficient in science, in philosophy, in mathematics, in astrology, in Hebrew grammar. In fact, his brilliance extended to probably almost every field of knowledge of the day. But despite his extraordinary capabilities, the Evan Ezra never succeeded financially, and he lived in poverty. When you say that he excelled in all those matters, was that secular education? He used to read books, or that was from Torah knowledge? No, it was also from secular education, and he would translate works and author works on some of these areas as well. Now, during the Almoravid uprising of 1135, this is not the same as the Almohad uprising in the times of the Rambam, which was not long afterwards. Rabbi Ram went into exile, and after an arduous journey, he arrives in, in Rome, in Italy, where he begins to compose his commentary on Chumash, on Nach. And during the next four years, while moving from place to place in Italy, he ends up writing on most and perhaps on every Sefer in Tanakh. And from Italy, he travels to Provence and then to northern France, where he spends several years. But misfortune was, unfortunately, his constant companion. His wife died at uh, quite an early age and left him with one son, Yitzhak, their other children having already predeceased her, possibly having died in infancy. And this last son, Yitzhak, later married the daughter of Rebuda Halevi, the Kuzari. Uh, to whom the Ibn Ezra was very close. But then at one stage, Yitzhak left to Baghdad. And after a time, he converted to Islam. But he then repented and returned to Judaism. Now, the Ibn Ezra became critically ill in 1152. And he made a promise that if he recovered from his sickness, he would write a further commentary to the Torah. He did recover and he did write another commentary. There is now the Perusha Oroch, the long commentary, uh, as well as the Perusha Kotzer. But uh, perhaps the following poem, which some of our listeners will perhaps be acquainted with, provides an insight into the life of the Evan Ezra. I'm just quoting a part of it. The title of the poem is Bli Mazal, without luck. Obviously, I'm giving the English translation. If my business were in candles, the sun would not set. However I struggle, I cannot succeed. If I dealt in shrouds, no one would die as long as I lived. A dark humour there. Yes. Was he well known also in the Ashkenazi world? I don't know how much of his commentary was, some of it definitely, because it is uh, quoted. But the Evan Ezra was definitely respected. Um, two of the major balitosis of the Talmud Chachamim in northern France, Rabbeinu Tam and the Rashbam, were in correspondence with him. In fact, Rabbeinu Tam and the Evan Ezra even exchanged poems, uh, which is unusual for an Ashkenazi. 
And in doing so, Rabbeinu Tam acknowledges the greatness of the Evan Ezra, and he says, I am the servant of Avram, and I bow and prostrate uh, before him in all things, to which the Evan Ezra responded, heaven forfend that God's own angel should bow and prostrate before Bilam. So the Evan Ezra compares himself to Bilam and Rabbeinu Tam to the Malach Hashem. And the Evan Ezra is, in fact, mentioned in Toysavus in And you can see his uh, poetic abilities. Um, yeah. It's also known that the Evan Ezra, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, came to London once. Yes, that is uh, very well known, spoken of. We will we'll get there, uh, but perhaps in short, just to say that in 1158, the Evan Ezra traveled to London and he composed a sefer called Yesaid Moira, which is the reasons for... Uh, mitzvahs, Tamiya mitzvahs, and he also wrote a letter which we are going to return to later. And then in 1160, he was again in Provence, in Narbonne, and he then wanders beyond, he spent his life wandering basically. Now, in terms of his approach to being one of the uh, Mephorashim, right, printed in, in the Mikroes Gedolus, uh, so the Evan Ezra interprets Tanakh using pshat and not agadata, not the agadic uh, meaning. Although obviously when it comes to any of the mitzvahs, even if they are based on medrash, he adheres absolutely to the views of the uh, Tanoim, the sages of the Talmud, and reprimands anybody who strays from this path, even if the person doing so is a recognized scholar. But his approach was pshat, and due to its popularity, the Evan Ezra's commentary on Chumash has had 50 uh, what are called super commentaries written to explain the Evan Ezra. Now, he often relies on grammatical explanations, and um, pshat is bound by rules of grammar as well as logic. I, I remember discussing the approach of the Evan Ezra to Chumash with Ramesh Shapira Zatzal, and he mentioned in this context that the uh, Gemara in Bov Metzia talks about Bali Mikra, Bali Mishnah, that there are people who are able to be masters of the area of Mikra, of Chumish, and there's a separate discipline called being Bale Mishnah, which means that it is possible to interpret Chumish without resorting to the interpretations that are found in Mishnah. When you are concentrating on explaining the meaning of the Psukim, once again, that will never overrule what Halacha and the Gemara has paskened, but it is, allows you an approach to Chumash, and that is one that the Evan Ezra took. And also, for people who are familiar with the Evan Ezra, he will use um, humor, even sarcasm, to mock the commentaries of the Karaites, the, the sect that rejects the oral law and the Gomorrah. Uh, so, for instance, on the posuk, Ve'ene Leo Rakois, when we are first introduced to Rachel and Leo in Parshas Vayetze, the translation being Leo had weak eyes. So the Hebrew word Rakois, Evan Ezra quotes a commentary, Ben Ephraim, a Karite, who says that the word is missing an Aleph. And if you add an Aleph to the word Rakois, it becomes Aruchois. And it means that the eyes of Leah were long. So the Evan Ezra's sarcastic comment on Ben Ephraim's explanation is that where does he get this Aleph from? He took it from his own name. Because if you take away an Aleph from his name, then Ben Ephraim becomes Ben Porim, which means the son of bulls. Um, now... With regards to famously Yaakov coming for the brochus and telling his father Yitzchok, Ani Esov, uh, I am Esov, uh, your Bechayr, and I have done what you have asked me to do, the Evan Ezra writes that some commentators claim that a Novi would never lie. But, says the Evan Ezra, these are empty words, meaning the Evan Ezra disagrees with Rashi and others who try to show that Yaakov did not lie, that there was a comma in what he said, I am, I am who I am, and Esau is your firstborn. The Evan Ezra said, no, 
There are a number of Nevi'im and a number of people in Tanakh who did resort to deceptions when necessary. And he gives examples of David HaMelech, Elisha, Doniel, even Avram. Avram tells um, Avimelech, as we know, that Sarah was his sister, right, when she was his wife. Although, interestingly, I heard this week from Keith Breslauer that when he was in Egypt uh, recently, he was told that if somebody has numerous wives, the first is called his sister. Uh, but nevertheless, the fact that Avram is clearly criticized by Avimelech for deceiving him shows that the term is misleading if it's, I guess, used just blankly without any qualifying adjective. And we also find that Avram Avinu tells um, the people, the Naorim, the lads who accompany him to the Akedah, that he and Yitzchok will be returning to them, even though he intends offering Yitzchok as a korban. So uh, the Evan Ezra does have rules that he adheres to. Now, it is important. We mentioned in our podcast about Spinoza uh, that he wrote about the Evan Ezra that he's the first Bible critic. But as um, Shadal explains in the 19th century, and I quote, he, in other words, Spinoza, wrote a complete lie. It is true that Evan Ezra alluded via the hidden wisdom that there exist in the Torah some additional verses, as the Gemara itself addresses in, in Bava Basra, the Gemara Yudalad, where it talks about who wrote the Psukim of Moshe having died. And it talks about, you know, how Yeshua put the, potentially put the letters together. But getting back to Shadal, but nowhere in all his words and in all his allusions is there any room to regard him as not believing that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote this Sefer. This Spinoza, aside from having made some errors in his studies, also unquestionably spoke duplicitously and in several places misled his readers with guile. And the truth is that you find in the Evan Ezra's commentary, he writes that Yitzchaki, who's a Karait scholar, states in his book that this passage was written in the times of his Shofot, Chas v'sholem. Chas v'sholem, God forbid that the matter should be as he has written about his Shofot, his book should be burned. Now, in addition to his commentary, as we mentioned, he was also a paitan and a poet of religious literature. And the Hassam Sefer regarded the Evan Ezra's um, Zemer, Tzomo Nafshi, so highly that he sang it every Friday night when he came home from Shul for Kiddush. Well, uh, he wrote Kiddush Mara Shabbos, right? Yes, he did. But actually, he wrote that sort of for specific reasons, which the listeners will have to wait a few more weeks to hear about. You're doing a series to include him? I'm doing a series which will reference Ki Eshmer Shabbos. I'm saying nothing more at the moment. So all in all, he wrote at least 15 Svarim, besides for the commentary on Tanakh, including five on Hebrew grammar. Uh, he has the Sefer Hagona al Rabsad Yagon, a defense of Rabsad Yagon against criticisms. He has a Sefer called Sefer Hashem, Book of the Name, um, which is a work uh, about the names of Hashem. One called Luchos, which are astronomical tables, and Sefer Ha'ibur on the calendar. And interestingly, uh, the Evan Ezra, although like many of his time, he believed in the effect and effectiveness of astrology. And he wrote several books on the subject. And this is the interesting one. There is a crater on the moon called Aben Ezra in honor of the Evan Ezra. So there you have it. Now, according to Professor Tzvi Langerman at Bari Lun, Evan Ezra wrote a significant mathematics textbook called Sefer HaMisbar, that played an important role in the transmission of the Hindu-Arabic numerals to the West. In other words, the number zero and all of the numbers that we are so familiar with, clearly the West was based on the Roman numerals. Um, so the decimal numeral system that uses 10 as its base potentially became known to Europe thanks to the Evan Ezra. Did he write this with any Jewish context, or was it purely a intellectual or educational book, um, say from his book? So, so the truth is, I don't know the answer to that question, but I would be surprised if it was written as a religious work. It might contain references, but that was not its purpose. That was not the reading of the book. It's not the first time we've come across the um, Gedolim of yesteryear that had more 
varied interests. Especially than, than in Spain. We used to. Yes, that was not uncommon. Correct. And the fact that you had many Gedolim in Spain who were, uh, you know, physicians, as well as the Rambam, as well as the Rambam, and a number of others, so that they were multifaceted. They, yeah, they had uh, different things that they did because that was the, the way that people were able to live. In Ashkenaz, it probably wouldn't have been possible for a number of reasons, and therefore they were much more compartmentalized as a result of the Christian exile. It was a help to the masses as well. I mean, today we have too much content available written by people who have studied the whole life it. But at the time, they were these were the greats in their field. And therefore... In other words, because they were, you know, the Rambam was the world's most respected doctor at the time. Nowadays, we have enough information accessible that uh, the Gdolim can focus on, on... I see what you mean. Yes, yes. Now, uh, the Evan Ezra also wrote riddles. I will give one at length. Two men had been traveling together, sat down to eat. Another traveler came and told them that he didn't have any food and he was starving, but he did have money with him and he would pay them for whatever they would give him. They agreed. And one of the two travelers had three loaves of bread. The other had two loaves and all of the loaves were the same size. The three people equally consumed all of the bread. The man who had no food left them five gold coins to divide up. So the person who owned the three loaves felt he deserved three gold coins and the, his friend deserved two gold coins because he'd had three loaves and his friend had had two loaves. His friend disagreed and said that since the third party consumed an equal amount from both of their breads, he and his friend should each receive two and a half gold coins. Which one is correct? Says the Evan Ezra, neither. The correct way to divide up the five coins is that the owner of the three loaves receives four gold coins and the owner of the two loaves receives one gold coin. You figure it out. Answer next week. And then there is a brain teaser in his Marpe Loshain. Fourteen students are travelling with him on a boat. A storm threatens the craft, and 15 of the 30 passengers must be thrown overboard. Everyone stands in a circle, and every ninth person is to be thrown overboard. So, you know, concentric circles, it gets smaller and smaller. Evan Ezra challenges his readers to figure out how he can arrange his students so that none of them will be selected. <laughs> Okay, okay, so, so now yeah. let's. I'm get... not going to be able to concentrate for the rest of the podcast now. <laughs> right, okay, well, I'll the I'll... listeners are welcome to send in their suggestions. Absolutely, I'll scribble down the answer. So now let's get back to London. At one point, as mentioned, um, Rabbi Avram Ibn Ezra found himself at the far edge of the world, England. Um, now, possibly he had spent several years in Rouen in France, uh, possibly 1154 to 1156. And from there, it would make sense that he would go to London because, as we've mentioned, in fact, in our probably a very, a very first podcast, that English jewellery in the 12th century was an offshoot of northern France. And he writes, Ani Avram Hasfardi ben Rubmea Hasfardi, Hanikra Evan Ezra, I, Avram, the Spaniard, son of Rubmea, the Spaniard who is called the Evan Ezra, Hischalti Lechaber Vekosafti Zeha Sefer, I began to compose and wrote this book, um, Bahair Londresh, right, in the city of London, in the island of Anglaterra, in the month of Tammuz, um, and therefore we have proof that indeed he was in London. But there is what is called the Igeres Shabbos, a letter that occurs as a result of the events of Friday night, the 14th of Teves in the year 4919, i.e. 1159. He writes, I, Avram Hasfardi, was in one of the cities of the island that is called the edge of the earth. I was asleep and I dreamt what appeared to be a man stood before me with a sealed letter in his hand. He spoke up and said to me, take this letter that the Shabbos is sending to you. I read it through and it reads as follows. I'm only going to give you a very short extract of this. Ani Shabbos Ateres Dos Yakorim. I am Shabbos, the crowned law of the uh, dear ones, Revius the fourth, but Aseris Advorim of the Ten Commandments. I am a sign of the eternal covenant between God and his children. 
Then the Evan Ezra carries on. However, as I read the last lines, my heart became agitated and my soul almost failed me. The messenger of Shabbos responded to me by saying, she, in other words, Shabbos, was told that yesterday your student brought books of interpretation of Chumash into your house in which it is written to violate Shabbos. Therefore, arm yourself on behalf of the honor of Shabbos to fight the Torah battle with Shabbos's enemies. Ve'ikot, and I awoke, v'atispoim ruchi olai, similar language to, um, well, both to Parai in his dream uh, in Mekates, but also to Nebuchadnezzar, v'nafshi uh, nivhalo mo'it, and my soul was uh, dis-ease. He looks at the books that he has there by the moonlight and finds the comment in there, with dawn of the second day, one full day ends, for nighttime follows daytime, meaning that the day ends at daybreak in Judaism, for Shabbos. And he writes, I vowed I would not allow myself to sleep after the conclusion of Shabbos until I wrote a lengthy letter explaining when the Torah day begins, thereby removing a stumbling block and a trap for all of Bnei Yisrael, even the uh, Tzedukim, know that the only reason for the Torah writing the portion of creation, the first 35 psukim of Bereshis, relating God's actions each day of creation, is so that the adherents of the Torah will know how to observe Shabbos. And then he writes a lengthy defense to prove that Shabbos starts at nightfall using psukim and astronomy and astrology and logic, etc. And um, at one point, there's a comment of the Evan Ezra, that when studying these things, man must never lose sight of our principal aim to obtain a knowledge of the works and the will of the Creator. Wow. Where did he get buried? Uh, that is not known. Uh, it's not known exactly when he died, around 1164, but uh, it is uncertain. Uh, there are guesses that range from northern Spain to Rome, even to London, and some say that the Evan Ezra travelled to Eretz Israel. We'd probably know if he's in London now. Well, we don't have any Matsevas from that time at all, including Balitosis. Thank you. A well, brilliant series. Um, like I've said before, the letters have something uh, uniquely fascinating about them to get an insight into their minds and into what they saw as, as literally eyewitness accounts of what Jews looked like and what um, Jewish settlements looked like at that time. So thank you very much for that. It was clearly very heavily researched. And we will be releasing, as I said before, a, another podcast, a shorter one on the current events on the ICJ and the ongoing crisis that's happening there. Please send all questions or feedback to podcast at jaylee.org.uk. Please make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss another episode and keep sharing. Thank you.